you know, that standing uh, applause could have held. Dr. Chopra is a true Canadian hero. And uh, if you have not heard his story at all, I encourage you to um, do some research and learn a little bit more about it. And um, he's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are on this plate right now. But historically, uh, Dr. Chopra is the reason why we are not consuming recombinant bovine growth hormone in our milk history. the GMOs. The GMOs on their own are useless organisms. They are weak. They cannot survive without the cover of pesticides and the cover of corruption. Because without that, everybody is lying about GMOs. And that's why when young Rachel goes around labeling, they child her, they say, yes, we would like to, maybe we won't be, maybe we will. But on the other hand, they know they're not going to. And I'll give you the reason why they would never label anything GMOs. Because most people don't know that all our vaccines are made with GMOs. All our vaccines. And GMO products in making vaccines. These are not GMOs you eat. These are being injected into children by force. They can't go to school if they don't get vaccinated. This is coercion. Just yesterday, in India, in the Indian Supreme Court, the people of India have taken this to the Supreme Court and they are showing work and their case together. different from our, although we both from Commonwealth countries. In India, a single individual under the Indian Constitution is allowed to file a case directly in the Supreme Court if it involves the public interest. It is called EIL. In Canada, we cannot do that. We have to go through the whole rigmarole and lower courts and all the way. And, 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 and in my case, 
since I've been fighting this business since the time of bovine growth hormone, it's now 26 years. And I have been in court repeatedly. Even after getting fired, I've been still in court. Two days ago, it was my 80th birthday. I ain't given up yet. <laughs> so I, I had told my department, you think I'm getting old, maybe I'll get sick, maybe I'll die, but I'll tell you, I pray I don't, because I intend to remain a pain in your side for as long as I can. scientists have taken this matter up in the Supreme Court. Here is the difference between India and Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada, this, you can't just go to the Supreme Court and say, I have a complaint, I have an appeal, I want to be heard. No. You have to apply for what's called the leave to be heard. The Supreme Court then decides whether they will hear your case or not. If they say, here, yes, we will hear, then I think they're laughing. All of you, the farmers, the various organizations, that, and the journalists, they're already, already, they will be able to intervene in their own right. And so I'm warning you people, I'm asking you people, be ready soon. And if the Supreme Court says they don't want to hear, then in the Canadian system, it's not the law, it's only convention. They don't have to give you a reason why they don't want to hear. That's the end of democracy. If that happens, then the only thing left for us is street revolution. We should learn from India. We should learn from Vandana Shiva. We share a common name. I'm Shiv Shiva. First name and last name. If those of you know about the gods of India, Shiva is the god of all gods. First destroy, then recreates. That can be going. <laughs> I didn't know about, I didn't know Vandana directly, but I have read about her when I was in the meshes of uh, Health Canada, hating scientists, quietly working away. And somewhere I read that she had led a movement in India and street saving and going to the Supreme Court. I said, that's the woman I want to meet. So I asked a friend of mine, another famous Canadian, Mark Barlow. Mm -hmm. I said, Mark, when Vandana comes here, I'd like to meet her. So Mark arranged a meeting uh, over dinner. That's when I met Vandana. It was in the days when I was fighting uh, in the days of uh, low and growth hormone. And my former friend were dragging me to the Senate uh, uh, for, for Britain. So we met. And a couple of years later, Vandana uh, invited me to India on an international conference, a huge, big conference in New Delhi, and several Canadians, Persis, Mice, and a whole lot of people went from here. And you know, her connections, and uh, this was amazing, that one of the, and I, uh, my, uh, uh, what I delivered there is still on my website, that Prince Charles, the establishment doesn't pay much regard to Prince Charles, but he is an organic farmer. Prince Charles sent a videograph speech to that conference. It was amazing. It was, it was so good that we spoke in India about what was happening. Now my hope is that now that Anna Shiva is here, 
that we and Jody have gone back and forth and we are in the makings of. I think we should twin India and Canada people to people. The G7, the G20, they're meeting in Australia right now, playing all the corrupt politics. They're all making these deals, trade deals. In my opinion, you can make any trade deals, take food out of it. Food should not be traded. Because that's a right. That is a right given by God. Foundations of Physics, PhD, in, uh, at Western. 
And the topic of my thesis was non-locality and non-separability in quantum theory. Now, 100 years ago, we realized that everything is connected in <laughs> physics. Biology is about interconnections. There wouldn't be life without interconnectedness. Life is a web of life. That's a dangerous idea. <laughs> it's a dangerous idea in terms of shaping our worldviews in order to shape our actions. Another dangerous idea, given that for 200 years there's been an attempt to make it look like the Earth is just dead matter to be exploited. All it is is that much of oil to be squeezed out of the tar sands, that much of uranium to be mined. My state, I, I come from Uttarakhand, a very beautiful state. And we used to be called the Devabhumi, the land of the gods. We have the Ganges and all the tributaries, and at the source of every tributary is a temple to the river goddess, to the Bhagirathi, to the Yamuna, to the Mandakini, to the Yalaknanda. A few years ago they said, no, these rivers, are just that much hydroelectricity, that much was. So all the billboards were changed by the government. And now we were called Urja Pradesh, the energy uh, state. Except that last year when we had extreme climate event, 350% more rain on the first two days of monsoon, all the dam building and hydroelectric power building that had destabilized the rivers put huge amounts of debris in the river beds to the 13, 14, 15 mile tunnels. When the river floods came, they carried all this muck with them. And our river beds rose 40 meters in some places, carrying away villages and bridges and roads uh, and homes. 20,000 people died. It didn't make the news anyway. It didn't make the news anyway. And it was one more confirmation to me of how much the media is controlled in terms of what's the news to carry, what makes sense. But not only do most cultures rest and stand on the idea of a living earth, even science has, to, has had to come around to recognizing that the earth is living. Uh, the NASA scientist James Lovelock uh, realized that if he gave a long name to describe the scientific principles of self-organization of the planet as a whole, which regulates its own temperature and creates the conditions for life, no one does. So he turned back to Greek mythology and called it the Gaia hypothesis, that the Earth is living. That's a dangerous idea. When he wants to mine every mineral, destroy every ecosystem for energy, for fracking, for dust. I mean, every aspect of the fossil fuel edifice today is crazy <laughs> if you looked at it through sanity. Who would squeeze oil out of the dark sand? Who would frack the earth to get a little bit of gas? You know, we, any intelligent species would say, we mind as much as we need it to. It, we, anyway, Taking out all that old biomass that became fossilized isn't a good idea. And uh, if now we're running out, let's shift. And there's enough energy that the sun gives us, and there's enough energy that the wind gives us. So much more. So much more than the two favorites, fossil fuel and nuclear. You know, I did spend some time training in India's nuclear establishment and would have joined our um, our Atomic Energy Commission, but I have a sister who's a doctor, and she asked me a few questions about uh, what I was happening when I was in the experiment for fast breeder reactor called Purnima. I had no answer because I never had a single class in the biology of radiation. And that's when I decided I'd go to more foundational studies and understand more holistically. Uh, basically, nuclear energy is just a very, very risky and wasteful, wasteful way to boil water. <laughs> all you do, all you do is trigger it 
the mass, let it release the energy so that you can heat the water, create steam, and then generate electricity. When all we could need to do is say thank you to the sun and harvest the sunshine. Um, another dangerous idea, that all life is sacred. All species have intrinsic worth. And plants and seeds are not Monsanto's inventions. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have been invited to a meeting in 1987 where the corporations were laying out their plan for releasing GMOs in order to claim patents. A patent is granted for an invention and to claim a patent on seed is a claim to invention of the seed. And they went on to say we need an international treaty so that the whole world has to adopt patents because they, they were honest enough. This was, you know, we were talking 87, there weren't any commercial products. They came up a decade later. And basically they were saying, we're not going to make enough money through chemicals. And the money we'll make now will be through owning the sea and collecting royalties because when something is patented, When something is patented, then you can prevent anyone else from making, owning, selling the patented product. So the main idea was to prevent farmers from saving seeds. And I found it such a wrong idea because not only had I spent all my growing years uh, in the defense of nature, including as a volunteer for the Chipko movement, I had from 84 onwards when Punjab became a zone of violence, so I had gone to study the Green Revolution very deeply and realized that dependency on seed and chemicals had ruined this most prosperous land of the Punjab in India. And I really love your idea, Shiv, of an India-Canadian citizen solidarity. It could address so many problems. It could address so many problems because people will start looking for common solutions. Since all our threats come from the same few players, we're talking about five companies controlling the seed. And at this point, primarily Monsanto controlling the GMO seed. We're controlling about, talking about five companies controlling the grain trade. Cargill being one of them, the biggest, which bought up the second biggest continental. Now the international trade is made to look like the basis of the economy. It is not. So-called free trade is absolutely unfree for people. It's free trade for corporations. And it is basically designed to take over the Earth's resources and the local economies of the world through very coercive instruments. Very coercive instruments. The most coercive to me is the idea that you can prevent farmers from saving seeds. And that's why I went back from that meeting in 87 with a commitment that now onwards this is what I would do, save seeds, and started Navdanya, the movement, which means nine seeds, it also means the new gift. And for us the new gift is off the commons. And we've learned over time that while it is our duty. You know, we began with a pledge that we've received these seeds from nature and our ancestors. It is our duty to protect them in their integrity and diversity for the future. We will not adopt any technology or obey any law that comes in the way of this sacred duty to the earth and future generations. across the cultures of the world, like cultures of the First Nations, that was a very normal idea. That's how life was organized. 
And through the seed and through food systems that are just and sustainable, we can undo so much of the violence and brutalization of humanity by going beyond anthropocentrism we reclaim the respect for all of life. But respecting all life also enables us to undo the worst of sexism and racism and religious intolerance that are born from the idea that there are lesser beings on this planet. When the me mechanical philosophy was being put in place, the phrase that was constantly used was the empire of man over lesser creatures. And it was repeatedly said that the veneration through which indigenous cultures hold nature is an impediment in establishing these empires. But the empire man over lesser creatures was not just over other beings and species, it was also over other cultures. And that harm has to be undone if we are going to have peace in society. Yeah. At the time of colonization, as much as the continued colonization of today, one of the ideas that is blindly imposed, and that's what the G20 is discussing, is growth. Yeah. Yeah. The last time I spoke at a festival of dangerous ideas at the Sydney Opera House, it asked me to talk about how growth creates poverty. And it does. Because every time you chop a forest, you have growth. When you destroy all the ecosystems and cultures where the tar sands are, you have growth. But you don't have growth of life. You don't have growth of well-being. What you have is growth of money in the hands of a few people. And so GDP by its very design, it's made to look neutral. But it's not neutral. It's a political instrument of concentration of economic and political. The definition in the UN, interestingly, just like chemicals that came into agriculture were born from the wars, the economic measurements that dominate our lives came from the wars. GDP and GNP were first tried in very rudimentary forms at the time of the Depression, but then it was really during the war years in England that the governments had the challenge of how do you take out more resources from society in order to feed the war. Very much like the RBGH, that shift stopped. Because what does the recombinant bovine growth hormone do? It makes the cow give a little more milk for a few shorter years by diverting the energy of the cow from maintaining its own body to producing more milk. So GDP, in effect, was how do you take out the wealth of society from maintaining society's own health and well-being to getting armaments, more jet planes, more bombs, more tanks, more salaries for the armies. The definition of GDP is, uh, it's based on a production boundary which says if you produce what you consume, you don't produce. <laughs> so nature doesn't produce, women don't produce, that's why it's always, you know, other women don't work. And women who work morning till night, feeding their kids, taking care of the house, taking care of the sick, yeah, they've been made to say, I don't work. <laughs> you know, they've, they've sort of taken on that identity of I don't work. Because the only work that counts is where you are producing commodities for someone else to consume. And you are then consuming commodities someone else has produced. And this has led to this very deep crisis in food of a billion people permanently hungry. And half of them are producers of food, but they are not producers of food, they are producers of commodities. And they are producers of commodities at high cost. So they are perpetually paying back their debt or folding up. The disappearance of the family farm is so related to this crazy idea of measuring productivity and growth that has nothing to do with real growth and has nothing to do with real productivity. In the years since we started to save seeds and help farmers go organic, 
I, I also worked a lot with them to not give up diversity, to go beyond what I had called the monoculture of the mind. And now we've been assessing for more than 10 years how do these farms perform with native seeds, biodiversity and ecological agriculture. When you measure output not in the yield of a single commodity, but in the nutrition per acre, the nutrition is so much higher, higher on small farms and in gardens that our calculations show that we could feed to India's if, if we allow gardens to expand, we would feed two, feed two times the world population. So the biotech industry's mantra is they're going to be 9 billion people, and how do we feed them? Well, you definitely can't feed 9 billion with GMOs. <laughs> Just the only four GMOs. Corn, canola, soya, cotton. You know the story of canola, how your prairies were devastated, how Percy Smizer was sold. Corn and soya, most of it, 90% goes for animal feed and biofuel. 90% corn and soya goes for animal feed and biofuel. And I would imagine that even the 10% that's being eaten by humans would stop being eaten by humans if they had a label. It's not a food system. It's a money-making system. Yeah. A money-making system at the cost of destroying the earth, our biodiversity, and our health. And we have to start thinking of those three as one. The health of the planet and our health is not separable. So we have learned over these many years that the more you obey the laws of the soil and the seed and the biodiversity, the more food the earth will give you. This idea of extracting more is a very blind idea. It's from through giving more to the earth we get more. And we've done this. The more you give back to the earth in terms of soil fertility, the healthier your crops, the more productive your crops. And so Albert Howard, who was sent by the British to India to uh, basically improve Indian agriculture, he, uh, he arrived, found a pest in the field, soils were fertile. As he said, I decided to make the pest and pest in my teachers. And he wrote a book called The Agricultural Testament, which is called The Bible of Modern Organic Farming. And there were two principles he learned from the practices of Indian peasants before the Green Revolution. One is diversity. He didn't use diversity, he called mixtures. Called them mixture. And the second is the law of return. Then you've got to get back. But the law of return is vital not just to have sustainable systems, it's vital to have just systems. We have been made to believe by the industrial agriculture promoters that farmers should be given nothing. Extract as much as you can from farmers. Turn them into your consumers of, of poisons and then buy cheap from them. The law of return is what we work with in terms of the members of Nathania. And we've just released a new book, um, the Agriculture Minister of India released it. The farmers were using seed, their own seed, their five seed sovereignty, using ecological method, no chemicals, no pesticides, no fertilizers, and are engaging in fair trade. That means they have a return, a fair return. They're earning 10 times more than any package imposed on them in the name of increasing their incomes, whether it be hybrid rice or hybrid corn or BT cotton, which is the only GMO introduced to India. And even that was delayed quite a bit because, you know, in 98, when Monsanto came in and started to put ads in the newspapers, 
I knew what the laws of the country were because I'd had a role in them. So I rang up our ministries. I said, did they take approvals? We have to take approvals in India. And none of our ministries had been uh, approached by Monsanto. So I sued. I sued the government for inaction. And I sued Monsanto for illegal entry. four years, as Shifsi talks about corrupt to the core, they know how to bribe somewhere, a minister here, an official there. They did get approvals. Now, if I wasn't here, I'd have been at a big TV debate in India well, on the GMO issue. And uh, there's still this false claim being made that yields increased with BT cotton. They didn't. More <coughs> cotton was planted. And more BT was planted because all alternatives were destroyed. 95% of the cotton seed in India is now owned by Monsanto. And on every seed, Monsanto collects royalties. Royalties that are pushing up the price so high that farmers are getting into debt. And since 95 till now, more than 291,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide. Most of them are in the areas of cotton. Most of the cotton, as I said, is BT cotton. I won't go into too much detail about this. All, all I will say is the two things that are making the biotech industry desperate is one, that I did at some point in my life study physics. <laughs> and two, that we do the studies and work with farmers to provide alternatives in the areas where farmers are committing suicide because of BT cotton. Now that obviously is not a good story when they say the third world becomes prosperous. So they keep putting out all kinds of strange things. One paper said average farmers' suicides haven't gone up. And I always reply, look at the cotton areas. They've gone up. They've gone up hundreds of percent. The graph climbs like that, just like the BT. But I'm also very happy that by saving seeds, by creating seed banks of native seeds and helping farmers go organic, for the first time in the state of Vidarbha, where every half hour farmers was committing suicide, state of Vidarbha, this year we saw a 30% drop in the cultivation of BT cotton. Yes. And just like Shiv is now living in Vidarbha, I'm going to work The attacks on independent scientists, Arpad Putsai, um, Shiv himself, Seralini, and you know, when, when we had uh, that big conference, we also honored the nine warriors who had stood up to these giants. But another dangerous idea is that we need independent science to know what's really going on. That Monsanto's claims of more production less chemical use, safety, just doesn't hold. I'll just give you some data I just received from a recent study. They've always said BT as well as glyphosate. There are only two applications, four crops and two applications, BT and herbicide tolerance. And in terms of the herbicide tolerance, they use glyphosate, Roundup Ready. And in terms of the BT, is a bacillus thuringiensis, the genes from a soil organism. The the idea was that the Bt will control a pest and uh, the uh, herbicide tolerance will con control weeds. We instead have more pests than we've ever had, pests that never attack cotton in India, aphids, jacinths, mealybugs, army bugs, uh, and the bollworm is emerged resistant. And in the case of Roundup, you know what's happened in the prairies with the canola, but in the US, 17 mil, half the farmland is overtaken by super weeds. Yeah. Because any, anyone who knows about how evolution works, that there will be resistance, would know that this can't. But the thesis of the industry has been it's safe because BT degrades. A Canadian study showed it doesn't, doesn't. It was found in the blood of pregnant women and fetuses. And they said glyphosate disintegrates. Does it? Glyphosate in GMO corn was found to be 13 parts per million compared to zero. 
but worse is it is breaking the metabolic systems of the plant so badly that formaldehyde, which, which is formed and, and, and recycled and decays all the time, it doesn't accumulate. It is accumulating in GMO crops, 200 parts per million. And scientists are now busy to figure out what is making formaldehyde accumulate. And meantime, the beneficial minerals are going out. Calcium was only 14 parts per million compared to 6,000 in non-GMO corn. Manganese 2 against 14, magnesium 2 against 113. So we've got a highly unintelligent system of pulling out the nutrients from our food and putting in toxics. Not a smart way to deal with food. We need the opposite. Pull out the toxics and put in the nutrients. And that requires intensification of biodiversity and ecosystems, not the intensification of chemicals, not the intensification of corporate control. So another dangerous idea is freedom. Especially in these times, freedom has become a very dangerous idea. So the very idea of patenting seed was based on making it illegal for farmers to save seed. Farmers' freedom was made illegal. We said we will not obey this law. We will continue to save seeds because it's a higher duty. And that's what is Satyagra, the force of truth. They then tried to pass laws to make local indigenous seeds illegal. In India, they tried in 2004. We did an intensive Satyagra. I told the Prime Minister this won't work. We're not going to obey. We're in the land of Gandhi where the British tried to impose salt laws. And Gandhi walked to the beach and picked up the salt and said, we continue to make our salt. Nature gives it for free. <laughs> so we have the salt laws we passed. Last year they tried in Europe. A European law to make local seeds illegal. Through the seed freedom movement globally that Navdanya has started, and you can visit Navdanya for the work in India, and you can visit Seed Freedom for the global campaign. And I hope all of you will become active in it. We had to work with the European Parliament, with movements, and that law was sent back to the European Commission. More recently, we realized that in the same year, 2004, when they were trying it in India, they did write a law in USA, but they've only used it now. I'll give you three cases. In Pennsylvania, Seed Library was sent notice saying you can't have your own seeds, you can't exchange them. It has to be approved by centralized authority. Maryland, similar. I've worked with citizens of LA and you know, encouraged them to create seed libraries, then encouraged them to create a GMO-free LA, which they did. And the municipal council, just a few weeks ago, passed and ordered, approved an ordinance that uh, we will now be GMO free, which means now labeling, etc., will have to be done. So now they're getting notices saying GMO is seed. That's the only time they've said GMO is seed. GMO is seed, and seed laws can only be written by centralized authority, so you can't do it. But look at the other end. Seed is where farmers start to grow the crop, and eaters eat the food at the other end. They need to know what they're eating. 64 countries have mandatory GMO labeling laws. I had to put it into action through another Supreme Court case because governments sleep till they're made to act. No, the United States, which calls itself the biggest democracy in the world, has been trying, citizens have been trying in Washington, in California, recently in Oregon and Colorado to get labeling and money was used to mislead people um, to mobilize votes, and the citizens did not get GMO. Vermont passed the law on GMO labeling through legislative measure. Half the citizens, including young children, demanded a law on labeling it came through. So now they're being sued by the corporations on grounds that corporations are persons. And if people know what they're eating and have a label that informs them, then the corporation's free speech is being denied. 
So two more dangerous ideas. Corporations are not persons. Yeah. Decisions is not free speech. Now, in this period of the elections of the U.S. and an island in uh, in Hawaii managed to get a GMO ban voted. Now, to me, democracy is people decide what they want. It's of the people, by the people, for the people, and they say we don't want GMOs. Monsanto and Dow have joined to sue. They're suing. Hawaii, but who are they suing? They're suing people. <coughs> They're basically suing people and saying, your freedom will be squashed by us. We will exterminate your freedom. We will extinguish your freedom. Because they know that people's freedom and their imposing poisons and GMOs on people, that, that doesn't go together. Sooner or later, informed knowledge, democracy will win. So they have to kill democracy. So can you imagine? for one bad idea to put toxic genes into plants. They have to dismantle so much our democracy, our biodiversity, our health. And that's why I totally support Shiv's call that we all need to be ready to get to the streets. Because there will be no